Super. Uh, thanks very much um, to the to the Olomos team, actually both for for setting up this 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 nice program and and also this workshop today, um, and the and giving me the opportunity to to talk here and present our or talk our talk about our projects and activities, which is on 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 interfacing Germanium vacancy centers environment uh, with an open cavity system, and um, so I would like to now here we go. Um, so, so as as Radim um, already pointed out this morning, kind of we're I think we're on a on a on a transition actually, going from from pure quantum physics, quantum optics in the direction of of quantum quantum technologies, and this is quantum technologies in the context that we try to find uh, new new technologies, new solutions to 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 physical um, and, and and general scientific problems. And um, but but this also requires actually that we find new classical uh, technological solutions actually to make use of quantum physics and uh, and, uh, and and implement and demonstrate uh, scalable scalable technologies. And 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 one of those uh, solutions I think is is kind of uh, provided by, by 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 color centers in Diamond. So so Diamond in this context is like a. Uh, so I see this as a, as a white band gap semiconductor material with a band gap in the range of 5.5 electron volts. So it's it's sort of relatively large compared to, to other uh, materials. And and if if I, if I have pure uh, pure diamond, then this is um, uh, it can be considered as sort of a solid state uh, vacuum environment. But then at the same time, I can I can dope it. I can dope it with uh, with, with with defects. And some of those defects they have extremely well defined optical transitions. Now, um, we, we also have learned over the past uh, uh, decade or so that, that there's many uh, spins in the diamond. These spins can have uh, long coherences. And now what we try to attempt here is, is sort of to, attempt, uh, to, to interface uh, such a diamond crystal with, uh, with, with single color centers. So this diamond crystal can be seen here in the background with an optical fiber. The optical fiber is coming in from, from the, from the right-hand side. Um, there's a nice little cavity forming between the uh, between the fiber and the and the diamond, so that we we eventually try to to uh, determine and, uh, and 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 create a very efficient interface um, between the color center and uh, a single optical mode, which is supported by this uh, by this optical fiber. And sort of such a system of this kind, um, I think, or we we hope is, is is relatively robust. So the so the color centers. The optical emitters, they're, 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 they're kept in place uh, by the diamond crystal. Uh, diamond can be made very pure. So it is a nearly perfect solid state uh, vacuum environment. And, and a sort of a, a system and interface of this kind then can hopefully uh, yield applications for like uh, forming a, a single node in the quantum network where it can be made to generate a, a quantum repeater structure, the spins with long coherences that can be used as a memory and so on and so forth. And then more in the, in the context of our group. So this is a, a, I want to just put your attention onto a proposal uh, which already Ulrich mentioned this morning. So it's about the generation of uh, a, a GKP state, a proposal uh, which was put forward by Jacob and Ulrich. So it basically relies on that I have a, a, squeezed, a squeezed vacuum state, uh, which is being displaced. Um, and, then, and then this, this uh, state is scattered on a cavity system which contains a free level atom. So this free level atom could be a color center and diamond. Um, when the ground state of that system is put in the superposition state, um, a controlled rotation gate is being implemented. The measurement in the superposition state then sort of uh, projects the, the input state onto a superposition and repeat it in a repeated fashion that's, uh, that, that that scheme eventually yields to the generation of a GKP state. So that would be a nice, a nice application and, and, and this is, I think, a good motivation uh, what we are what we're heading towards to. Now, um, this sort of brings me to the, to the outline of this talk. So, so I would like in the, in the, in the next uh, 40 or 45 minutes, um, address a bit, um, or address uh, color centers in diamond, more, specific, more specifically, the Germanian Vacancy Center uh, we are working with. Then I would like to present um, our, our activities on, on GV center coupling to a micro cavity system. This is all done at room temperature. And then in the last part, I would like to go a bit deeper into our current efforts, which is about the, the cryogenic integration of that system. 
uh, hopefully towards um, achieving a coherent interface uh, between optical mode and the and the color centers uh, in diamond. Now, um, so I thought maybe maybe before going into into uh, GV centers, so I thought maybe may take a little detour. So when we talk about color centers in diamond, I think I think what most people or what comes to the mind of, to the mind uh, the first place from, of most people is um, is the so-called NV center. So, so the NV center is kind of is constituted of um, of substitution of nitrogen atom replacing um, a carbon atom in the in the in the in the diamond lattice uh, sitting next to a vacancy, and has sort of the nice property that that when I excite the diamond, which is rich in NV centers, when I excite this diamond with green light, then the diamond sort of lights up uh, in a in a nice uh, red color. And the and the most intriguing feature is that if I now at the same time uh, sweep a microwave frequency across, then I sort of see a dip of the of the fluorescence of the brightness of this um, of this of this red light um, at the resonance frequency of an electron spin, and the electron spin is kind of kept by the by the NV center. Now applying a magnetic field, the precession frequency of this of this electron spin uh, can be can be changed, and the and the and the and the the change in this precession frequency then can sort of be used as a measure for the for an applied magnetic field. And sort of this property, which is termed optically detected magnetic resonance, is sort of the main feature which has uh, caught a lot of attention and interest in, 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 in diamond color centers over the past uh, two decades. And it can be used to, to sense magnetic fields in with extreme resolution, so down to the nanoscale down to the nano uh, or pico tesla magnetic field range in extreme environments and also within biology because diamond is essentially an inert and a very robust environment which works very nicely at room temperature and even at high pressures now um, the nv center uh, itself so the electronic properties is is, is, is one aspect but then um, actually uh, in the diamond environment, I also have a lot of nuclear spins, or well, not a lot, but uh, but some nuclear spins. And the nice part about nuclear spins is that they about affect a thousand times weaker than the electron spin actually interact with the environment. So at room temperature, I can I have nuclear spins which have a coherence time which is in the range of milliseconds to seconds. And those nuclear spins again uh, can be coupled to the to to via the hyperfine interaction to the to the intrinsic electron spin of the NV center. So this is coupling strength. Which is in the range of megahertz, so a few a few megahertz up to 130 megahertz for carbon 13. And 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 um, and now the, the 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 aspect is pretty much that uh, that um, that I can use as I saw, as, as I've shown on the previous slide. I can use the photon electron spin um, interaction. I can use this to initialize and to read out the electron spin. The coherent part of this interaction I can use for for, for communication. So having a coherent interface between the photon and an electron spin. And now the hyperfine interaction between the electron spin and nuclear spin can be used for coherent control of nuclear spins. I can implement gates or with the, with the long lifetime or coherence time, I can use the nuclear spins essentially as a memory. And sort of this, 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 uh, this set of properties of that system um, has led to, to a number of very um, uh, important results. So, for example, for example, spin photon entanglement has been shown, error correction, or even the the loophole free belt test. Now, um, now this this sort of sounds all very nice, but there's a, a little downside to the NV center, and that is basically um, when when looking at the optical transition. So, so even when cooling the system down to a temperature of just about four Kelvin, um, it is essentially only about three percent of the total uh, optical transition which goes into the zero photon line. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the optical electron spin interface is extremely inefficient uh, for, for, uh, of, that, of that system. And, uh, and, and more and more, more precisely, so we're now sort of uh, uh, investigating this optical transition uh, in detail. So, so performing um, repetitive scans of this transition, I kind of see that, that, the, that the optical transition is not very stable. So it's typically... Um, uh, it is it's typically offsetting, um, um, actually quite significantly, uh, an effect which is termed um, spectral diffusion. Now, in in in, um, in ultra pure diamonds, so so diamonds with a, with an impurity level concentration in the in the range of parts per billion, and annealing at extremely high temperatures above uh, 1400 uh, should be degrees Celsius. 
sort of I can I can purify the environment, stabilize the emitters, and kind of get very stable and nice nice transitions. But um, engineering such a transition kind of is, is is really a challenge, in particular for nanophotonic or nanostructured uh, devices or diamonds, which is important for 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 uh, technological um, applications. Now the, the the underlying effect is basically that the NV center um, has a non-central symmetric um, um, structure. So that is that the um, it actually contains this this extra electron, uh, which is which is mostly contained at the at the lattice vacancy site. Um, at the same time, the the nitrogen gives away um, one extra electron. So that that is actually so this is the, the structural property which gives rise to that the NV center has. A permanent electric dipole, and the permanent electric dipole sort of gives rise to to the observation of the linear Stark effect. So applying an electric field, um, kind of, uh, so one one can observe uh, a linear shift of the transition energy of the optical transition energies with um, with a slope in the range of gigahertz per per megavolt per meter. Yeah. So so when when oops uh, when looking at at those kind of numbers, um, that basically means that at even single charge fluctuations, which are in the range of a few ten to hundreds of nanometers away from the color center, kind of give give rise to to energy level fluctuations um, within the within the line width of the optical spectrum. Now, um, so what is the solution, or what is the what is the way around this? Well. I mean, the DNV center is is perhaps extremely nice and and extremely powerful when it comes to sensing, and when it comes to spin physics, but uh, but it is maybe not the not the ideal candidate when it comes to optical transitions. So 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 maybe the question is: Well, among the more than 500 known color centers and flavors I have in diamond, uh, so maybe there's there's a few of them which have uh, also very interesting and and and. Um, uh, very interesting uh, optical properties. So, and in fact, uh, so, so looking at the carbon group elements, um, um, so, so there's a set of, of, of color centers um, um, which, is, uh, which are known as the silicon, the germanium, or the tin vacancy center. Um, so, so these, these color centers, uh, because of the, the atomic size, actually do not form uh, a, substitutional color, uh, a substitutional defect center, but actually an um, uh, so, so in, in that case, the, the, the color center is lying in between two vacancies. So this gives rise to a central symmetric system. It does not carry a permanent dipole moment. Um, and at the same time, because it's the same atomic group, so it's also not a dopant, so there's no free charges. And one can expect a higher stability. So in fact, um, um, investigating the, the optical spectra of these color centers, um, one actually can observe a very sharp a zero phonon line, so low scattering into phonons, and this is up to 60% uh, at room temperature into the zero phonon line um, for the silicon vacancy center with a transition around 740 nanometers, germanium vacancy, a transition around uh, 600 nanometer, or the tin vacancy center with a transition in the range of, uh, of 620 nanometer. And, 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 and more precisely, so, so the line width of, uh, of a single color center, a germanium vacancy center is typically about five terahertz, uh, um, even at, uh, at, at, at room temperature. So the, the level structure is a, is a bit more simple. So I have an optical ground and an excited state. These are orbital states split by about uh, two electron volts for the GEV center. And then due to spin orbit coupling, those, uh, those orbital states are further split up with a with a frequency around uh, in the hundreds of gigahertz range for the for the ground state and about terahertz uh, for the for the excited state. Now here on the right hand side, so this is uh, an investigation of uh, of uh, um, of the spectra of of, of single GV centers. So this, this shows about um, consecutive spectra of of uh, 20, 20 emitters. Um, and, and, and what we see here is the main transition line. And it actually, so, so what it displays is, 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 a, re, uh, is a rather narrow uh, low inhomogeneous broadening. So this is kind of uh, the, the, the promising feature uh, why, why I think they're, they're interesting uh, or why, they're, they're, why it's a promising, a promising candidate uh, to investigate in, in such a system. Then uh, another feature I wanted to, to highlight, and uh, this, is, this is the 
possibility to measure indistinguishable photons uh, from such a system. So this is a result I took from the group of uh, Fedor Yenet School at Ulm University, um, and it shows. Um, and this is this is a representative for for native uh, silicon vacancy samples. So what I have done here is to grow a diamond. During growth, uh, dope the diamond uh, with, with silicon. So it spontaneously forms uh, silicon vacancy centers. And that's kind of the way how you obtain uh, single color centers uh, with, with the lowest amount of, uh, of, uh, of a disturbance to the, to the environment. Now, what is shown here are sort of two different, uh, two different measures, uh, two different measurements. Um, so it's, it's an aerial scan of the, of the transition frequency of branches of the color centers along two different crystal directions. And what you can essentially see is that the transition frequency of one crystal direction here labeled in blue and another crystal direction labeled in red essentially falls exactly into two, into two different uh, branches of the, of the spectrum. And the, and the uh, inhomogeneous broadening is, 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 is to such a, a finite extent um, that you can obtain two photon uh, interference or homomundal interference from, from two different color centers without external tuning. So, so essentially addressing two color centers individually, interfering them on a beam splitter, you observe um, a nearly um, a very significant uh, 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 homomundal dip in the experiment without applying external control fields. Now sort of this, um, This uh, set of property now brings me to the next um, uh, part of this talk, which is about um, the, the, the decoupling of a GV center to a microcavity um, system. Now, because cryogenic integration is, is always uh, sort of a tricky, a tricky part. So, so the first, in the first part, I would just address a room temperature experiment, which we uh, carried out a couple of years ago. Now for, for, for interfacing uh, an emitter with a cavity, in the solid state. So there, there's sort of two different ways of how this can be achieved. One of them is um, an integrated cavity. The other one is an open cavity. So in case of the integrated cavity, what I essentially do is I take my solid state matrix, I localize where is the emitter, and then I start to build um, a cavity just around the, this, this single emitter. So what I do obtain in the end is a single emitter with a single cavity, one system, one realization. Now the challenge in that case is, or the, 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 the benefit in this case is that I can make photonic crystal cavities with an extremely small mold volume. So, so, so tuning such a system in the right way kind of um, um, brings me mold volumes, which are just of the order of lambda Q. So I can have extremely high uh, mold confinement, but uh, at the same time, processing diamond is, is really a challenge. So, so making such cavities with high quality factors kind of imposes uh, uh, some, te some technical uh, limitations. And for this reason, we have decided to actually go for the open cavity system. So in, in, in the open cavity system, um, it relies on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a flat uh, uh, diamond material. So this is just a slab of diamond, which is located on, on, a, on, a, on a bulk optical mirror. The, the diamond contains color centers, and then the cavity is formed between this flat diamond uh, composite system and an optical fiber, which is processed and, and, and encoded in the right way to form an optical cavity. Now, the, the advantage here is that, uh, that I, I do not only build a cavity just for one emitter, but essentially I can, I can, I can locate, I, I can locate the different emitters in the, in the environment, um, select the emitter, which has the, the, the needed properties, and then address this in the most efficient manner. On the other side, the, the challenge with the open cavity is that because it is not monolithic, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very prone to, to, to fluctuations. So, 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 so stabilizing the cavity within the, within the line width or within the finesse is sort of a technical challenge which has to be addressed. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm processing the cavities. Um, so, so, so the first part we need to do is, is, is kind of to form a concave mirror at the, at the end facet of an optical fiber. So this is a process which is which is um, relying on on a tightly focused uh, CO2 laser beam with a wavelength of about 10.6 micrometer. So it's infrared light, which is very well absorbed by by a silica um, optical fiber. So cleaving an optical fiber 
brings me a nice interface, tightly focusing um, an infrared laser, locally melts the material and eventually remelts and forms um, a, a concave optical mirror. So like shown by this interferogram uh, here on the left-hand side with a, with a radius of curvature in the range of, of 40 micrometer. Now these elements, both the flat mirror and the, and the optical fiber uh, can, be, can be coded with DBR mirrors. Such mirrors are, um, are straightforwardly engineered and designed. So here on the right-hand side, I show the, the, the transmission spectrum, um, both for the, for the flat part of the, of the substrate and the, and, the optical uh, and the optical fiber. And they're made in such a way to obtain uh, on resonance so around 600 nanometer for the GEV center, uh, a transmission coefficient, which is, which is in the range of 10 to the power of minus four. Uh, both for the for the fiber that's the that's the black line here, and the and the purple and the orange line, uh, which is the which is the flat the flat mirror or the flat substrate uh, containing the diamond. So with a transmission in the range of ten to the power of minus four, uh, that yields a cavity finesse which is around ten to the power of four to ten to the power of five uh, to ten to the power of five, which is sort of in in the range of uh, of state of the art values which can be which can be achieved. Now. Um, so there's, there's, there are two different cases for the, for the flat substrate. The, the orange line is without the diamond. The, 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 the purple line is with the diamond. And it's, as we see, when adding the diamond, diamond is a high index uh, material. Adding the diamond kind of slightly improves the reflection coefficient. And, uh, and it will be uh, nearly equal uh, to, the, to, the, to the transmission of the, of the fiber mode such that um, the, the, the light being generated in the fiber can with, with nearly uh, equal probability sort of escape for the two different sites. Um, we, we typically uh, sort of pump the system either on resonance um, of, the, of the emitter or off resonance. So for this, we use, uh, we use a, green, uh, a green laser at 532 nanometers. And for this purpose, so to avoid coupling of laser light or of, of green pump light, into the fiber, so the fiber itself is uh, is highly uh, reflective coated uh, at the at the green pump wavelengths, while the um, while the flat substrates are highly transmissive, so we're we're able to to get light into the system. Now, um, diamond processing is 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 a rather uh, it's, it's not a simple process, but it's it's a rather straightforward. Um, so the, the in the in the approach of an open cavity system, it, it only Requires uh, it only requires a planar etching of the of the of the devices. So to, so typically what we start with is, is a commercial diamond of, of of this kind as shown by the picture here. So that's a that's a diamond plate uh, with a thickness in the range of a few hundred micrometer. Uh, it has a cross section of a few millimeters square. So what we what we do is we, we first pin the pin the samples down to uh, to a thickness um, of uh, of of uh, between fifty and hundred micrometer. Um, then these samples can be implanted with the uh, with, with, with ions. Uh, in our case, it is germanium. High temperature annealed uh, yields the color centers, uh, while the while the, the the energy of the implantation kind of determines the depth. So this is optimized to uh, to implant the color centers at the, at a field antinode um, of the cavity. Annealing um, activates the emitters. Then the sample is being flipped around and finally thinned down in a, in a, in a, in a dry etching process to a, to a thickness which is just about a micrometer or even less. Now, what is, what is of utmost importance for, for, for um, an approach of this kind is the surface roughness of these diamond plates. So, so diamond is a, is, is, uh, has a high refractive index, about 2.2 or 2.4. Uh, so this gives rise to, to a single interface uh, diamond air reflections, which is, which is around 20%. So, so what, is, what is of utmost importance is to keep the surface roughness uh, to, to a very low level in order to avoid Rayleigh scattering uh, from the device. So, so what we need to keep in mind is, is that we have a target finesse, which is just about 10 to the power of four. So, so that means um, any kind of reflections or scattering from the surface uh, due to Rayleigh scattering, uh, which is in the range of, uh, of, uh, of uh, like one event in 10 to the power of four, so it would actually spoil the cavity and, and sort of make the, uh, the system uh, not usable. 
So a typical experiment now now looks like this: that we 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 load this this diamond crystal onto um, uh, onto uh, onto a, uh, the DBR mirror I've just shown before. Uh, we we approach this, uh, we we insert this into a microscope, and from the backside through this uh, through this mirror, through this flat mirror, we excite the system with uh, with, with with green light. Uh, this is all at room temperature. Now the, the the substrate is highly reflective for the for the emission line. Of the color centers, so so in order to observe um, 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 emission, we approach it from the from the other side with a microscope objective bandpass filter. Uh, the emission or the fluorescence light at at 602 nanometers, so this is the uh, transition line, and then scan it the transverse plane. And the uh, we, we scan the diamond sample across the focus of the pump beam, and then plot um, in this in this color plot we, we plot the the, the the fluorescence signal recorded with an APD. And then, like like in any uh, confocal scan, so we we ideally um, observe uh, a number of bright spots. Then we can sort of focus onto one of those spots, analyze the properties in more detail. And so, for for instance, uh, for the for the spot up here, which is nicely isolated, recording a second order correlation function, we see a nice dip at uh, at zero time delay. So this this nicely indicates or strongly indicates that we're actually in indeed investigating a single germanium vacancy center. Then um, at the same time, you might maybe maybe think, oh well, I mean the the, the photon counts uh, per second. So this is in the range of of a few thousand uh, per second. This is uh, already taken at a, at a relatively high excitation power. These counts are are quite low, and this is indeed true. So uh, so so the the uh, the experiment is or the, the the photon counts we obtain in this in this approach is not very high, and the main reason is actually that that now we have a diamond crystal. It has a thickness of um, of, of about a micrometer. The color centers are located lumped over two from the from the um, from the mirror away. And the configuration here sort of gives rise to two to guided modes which are which are guided here in the in the in the XY plane. And this is what we can see here on the right hand side. So this is a, a calculated uh, spectrum of the or the calculated power density as a function of, of longitudinal wave vector. So um, so the modes for a wave vector um, between zero and one, this corresponds to the radiation field. So this is all the modes we, we can collect with the, with the microscope objective. Um, while this zoo of modes we have for higher, uh, for higher wave numbers here kind of corresponds to, to, to guided waveguide modes uh, of that structure. So it is essentially that these modes, they take up a lot of energy or radiation from the emitter and thereby uh, limit the, the attainable uh, photon counts we have here in the experiment. Now uh, let's have a look at the at the at assembling the cavity. So in the next step, we we approach uh, the backside of the of the cavity or of the of the diamond uh, mirror structure with the optical fiber. Forming the cavity, we send uh, white light in through the fiber and and observe the spectrum of that system uh, through the through the microscope objective. Now scanning uh, the the, the, the cavity length uh, and then and monitoring the spectrum, you sort of uh, you you typically um, monitor such a dispersion diagram as we see it here on the right hand side, and um, and and in contrast to to a free space spectrum or an, or a, an, a regular air cavity, you would have, you you would explain uh, simply a parallel straight lines corresponding to the to the guided modes in that system. However, here we sort of see such a, a wavy type of uh, structure. And the underlying reason for this is that is that uh, because of the high refractive index between uh, of, of diamond and the and the reflections uh, at the diamond air interface, uh, we essentially have a two uh, a, a coupled uh, two cavity system uh, in here. So this is shown uh, here on the uh, in these two graphs at, at the bottom. So um, uh, depending on the on the cavity length, um, I can have either um, a diamond-like mode. So the diamond-like mode is when the electric field is mostly contained in the diamond. So this is the preferred um, situation we have for, for coupling to the color centers. Uh, and we have here uh, where, the, where the slope is, uh, is a little bit, um, uh, is, 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 is lower compared to the, to the parts up here where the slope is steeper, which corresponds to an air-like mode. Um, so, so in that case, the majority of the electric field inside the cavity is contained in the air. In the air part of the cavity, and 
this example or these uh, these these these, uh, these simulations they also um, highlight the importance of of a low surface roughness. So. For a strong light matter interaction, I would like to have most of the electric field being contained in the diamond. Now, uh, now the, the, the diamond-like mode in contrast to the air-like modes actually have a field antinode at the air-diamond interface. So that means um, with, uh, with, with a high electric field at this, at this interface, I actually need to maintain a low surface roughness in order to, to avoid scattering and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, maintain a high, high cavity finesse. All right. So, so measuring the cavity finesse. Uh, so we we have we have followed uh, two different approaches. So, to, so the the nice approach uh, we could do at at six thirty seven nanometers. So at this wavelength, we had available um, an optical an electro optical modulator. We could modulate uh, the, the, the the probe light field with, with four gigahertz. Uh, test the cavity the cavity transmission, and we we have measured. Um, um, the, the spectrum out of this. So, using these four gigahertz as a calibration line, we could calibrate that the that the cavity finesse at this wavelength was about uh, the cavity uh, the cavity alignment at this wavelength uh, was about two and a half two and a half gigahertz. Now, um, now the the, um, the 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 transmission coefficients actually quite strongly depend on the wavelength. So, this is not necessarily a reliable measurement to uh, to to obtain the cavity finesse. So instead, at a more interesting or more relevant uh, wavelengths of 602, we had to rely on the on the standard measurements, so, so uh, scanning the cavity length uh, over one free spectral range, and then comparing to the to the uh, to the to the um, to the line width of the of the transmitted peaks, um, we obtained a finesse which is about about 11,000. So that is kind of in the range of what we expected. But the error bars are quite large, and this is the, so the reason here is is and and, and is, is 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 pretty much that that uh, a cavity with a finesse in this range, sort of the the uh, the, the line width and length space is just about um, 100 picometers. Yeah. So so this so so we're quite prone to to, to fluctuations uh, of the system in that case, and therefore these these large uh, these large error bars. All right. So so now um, now the, the the next challenge uh, where one has to face is is to is to locate uh, emitters in that system with the with the cavity integrated now um, it's not just about to to address the emitter but it's about to actually tune the cavity resonance on the emitter and uh, at the same time um, yeah so so fixing fixing the cavity length so what we have implemented is is what we call a, a 3d cavity scan so so for each position in the transverse plane we also scan the cavity length uh, we, 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 we do record the maximum uh, counts at the, at, at, at the, at the transition, uh, at, the, uh, at the emission line, and plot this uh, again in such a color, bar, uh, color plot here. And the, 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 the result of this fiber scanning technique is shown here on the left-hand side, and compared to the confocal scan we have seen before, um, I think it is rather, is rather similar. And in fact, we could sort of locate at the same emitter which we analyzed before, which was isolated, is also visible now in this, in this fiber spectrum. So we're quite confident that, that uh, using this method, we could uh, locate and, uh, and address a single, a single GV center um, here in the system. Now, um, so characterizing the system, um, so we see here on the top left-hand side, this is a, this is a spectra recorded from this, from this color center. Uh, uh, or, yeah, so these are these are spectra recorded from the color center as a function of relative fiber position, and there's a, a faint a faint line in here. So this is essentially tuning the the cavity resonance um, across the the the, the, the five terahertz uh, um, zero four line of the emitter. So integrating this one sort of nicely resembles the spectrum measured of the emitter in free space. Now tuning the cavity on resonance. And, and sweeping different longitudinal modes, we also see a nice uh, longitudinal mode spectrum going from m equal 18 to down to m equal 16. Um, further down, we couldn't go because because we at some point we we be uh, the, the fiber touched uh, the substrate. Um, but but also uh, recording the, the the photon counts as a function of pump power, we see a nice saturation behavior. And uh, as expected for the m equal 16 mode, the Mode volume is is uh, is uh, uh, quite a bit smaller than for the M equal 18, so the attainable count rate is, is also uh, increased uh, for this one. Now, um, 
sort of uh, physically uh, the system right now, the, the system in that state is deeply in inside the, the bad emitter regime. So the cavity resonance uh, with a line width of about a gigahertz is much more narrow than the, than the emitter transition with a, with, a, with a terahertz line width. So there is no attainable or no measurable uh, Purcell factor in that system. However, in order to quantify the, the, the coupling, what we, what, we, what we have decided to, to do is, is, to, is to measure the free space uh, count rate uh, corrected for the, for the detection efficiency and, and the measurement bandwidth. And in free space, we have um, a count rate of, uh, which is in the range of 19 counts, 90 counts per, photo, uh, per second per, per, per gigahertz. Now the same system inside the cavity, the number increases to about uh, 2,800 uh, photons per second per gigahertz, which is an enhancement of about a, a factor of 31. But again, there's no Purcell, there's no Purcell effect or no Purcell enhancement uh, of, the, of the transition uh, rates in, this, in the system whatsoever. Now, the, the next part is that, that we're, we're, in the, we're, we're in the process of, um, of integrating that system uh, into a cryogenic environment. And this is what I would like to address in the uh, remaining, uh, in the remaining uh, time of this talk. So first of all, um, so, so we, we, we decided to implement our system in, in, a, in, a, in the bath uh system. So the bath uh has, uh, has has no active uh, cooling devices uh, installed, so so we hope that uh, that just a passive isolation with a, or a passive um, isolation with a with a vibration isolation stage uh, will serve to stabilize or to obtain the cavi a stable cavity cavity resonance. And in fact, this is what we can see here on the right hand side. So this is the displacement spectrum um, of a, of a cavity resonance measured uh, in vacuum, which is the the, the, the gray trace and, and and filled with air. So in vacuum, for a cavity, uh, cavity fast, finesse of the order of uh, 10,000, as we had it in the experiment, we have a stability which is, which is exceeding a second. So, so I hope that, uh, that this is actually quite encouraging uh, that the system will also work when, when cooled down to full Kelvin temperature. Uh, another aspect is, which is more on the technological side, that we're also in the process of making new fibers with a reduced mode volume. So previously, uh, the mode volume, uh, the the, the, the cavity uh, radius of curvature I have shown you was in the range of about 45. So now we made a new setup where we can uh, where we can uh, more controllably more, uh, more, uh, yeah more controllably uh, focus down the the infrared laser beam onto the onto the tip of a of a, of a fiber. So we we have incorporated this with a nice uh, positioning system, and uh, and we are now. Um, in the range, or we are we're now able to to actually obtain radii of curvature, which are um, about about 20 micron or even a, a bit less, while maintaining the depth of the of the concave mirror in the range of uh, of, uh, of, of of two to three micron. So to have to have a uh, shortest possible uh, cavity. Now now dealing with, uh, with 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 such an infrared laser setup is is, is kind of uh, not not the for an optics person like me, this is not the, the most straightforward way way to, to to work with, and the challenge is really that that if you focus um, um, if you focus infrared light uh, into an absorbing material, well, first of all, there is no way that you can that you can observe where is the spot. So um, so so what we typically do is that we place the the, the fibers uh, in the in the in the um, in the focus of the CO two laser where we think it is it is right, and then we perform. A number of uh, a number of test uh, or uh, test shoots uh, shootings um, around the, the the jacket uh, of this of this fiber, and when we think that we have we have located the fiber in the focus, uh, we aim at the center and then carry out the, the, the final shooting. And as I said before, so now we are sort of in the range of of uh, of, of of obtaining a radio of curvature which are 20 micron or eventually a little bit less. So we have also um, um, incorporated or like uh, investigated uh, these, 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 these diamond membranes uh, with, with GV centers now in the cryogenic setup. Um, our cryostat can go down to four Kelvin at the moment. Um, and and if, if, uh, if exciting it with 532 nanometer light, uh, performing um, a scan of the sample in the laser focus, we again obtain these, these, these nice, um, these nice uh, fluorescence uh, uh, scans. 
identifying single spots. Then guiding those spots into a spectrometer, we sort of see now the, the spin orbit coupling um, um, appearing around the zero phonon line. And what we typically do then is, is, to, is, to, is to characterize, to identify these individual uh, emitters and uh, by, the, by the frequency of the main transition, which, is the, which, uh, which I label the transition between states number one and three in here. So the, the, the spin orbit coupling with, with uh, hundreds of gigahertz is not enough uh, to, uh, to, to fully ground state populate the, the emitter. So, so the, the states uh, two, three, and four, or state, state number two, is 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 is, um, is, uh, is 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 firmly is firmly populated. So when off resonant exciting, I sort of see typically at four Kelvin, I see typically uh, four transition lines, uh, which I can associate with these uh, with these four allowed uh, transition transitions in the system. Now, um, so we use this we use the spectra to to now uh, locate our um, um, a resonant laser onto the transition one three, which is the strongest one in this case. And then perform a resonant scan of this laser um, across this across this line. And if the emitter is, is behaving what we think is nicely, then a, re a repeated scan across the emitter kind of kind of yields a, a spectrum, as we see here. So this is about 50 scans uh, carried out uh, over about uh, one minute, and we see that that this emitter at least uh, behaved rather nicely. So it's a, it's a fairly stable uh, transmission. Looking at the at the strength of this transition as a function of excitation power, we see a saturation behavior, and and measuring the line width of these transitions as a function of base temperature of the cryostat, um, we see power we see broadening uh, due to the occupation or scattering of phonons, and going down to four Kelvin, sort of gets us in the in the in the in the range of the line width um, about 100 megahertz, or sometimes even less. So kind of approaching the, the natural line width of the system, which is in the range of 30 megahertz uh, for these uh, for these defects. Now this is really this is really um, I mean I mean that um, it is it is not just one emitter which shows these properties, but it's it's, it's actually many emitters. So so this is this is a um, this is a very nicely and, and reproducible kind of behavior we have. On the other side, um, I think we also have to be realistic and and and, and realize that well this is a solid state system. In the solid state, many things can go wrong and many things can happen. So we also see many, many emitters uh, which actually do not show such a clean and nice spectrum. So here uh, I, I'm, I'm showing two examples of, uh, so on the left-hand side, this is an emitter which shows, we call it a spectral jumping uh, between, two, between two resonance lines. Uh, the, 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 the energy difference between those is about 80, uh, 800 megahertz. But we also see many emitters uh, which have a more complex spectrum, so here, there's about five transitions uh, shown uh, in that case, and then and if you now so sort of take the take the cases with uh, with just two resonance uh, with two resonances or two two spectral lines, and uh, and we make a histogram. So this is shown here on the right hand side. Well, we we have that that so some of the emitters they scatter, uh, they they have uh, they have a. Uh, uh, um, uh, they have uh, uh, jumps which go up to the to the gigahertz range, but most of them they actually contain down to the uh, they're contained down to to, to frequencies uh, up to up to gigahertz and kind of yeah, peaking up uh, close to zero. Um, now um, again, so I, I mentioned this before. So for these uh, central symmetric systems, there is no linear stack shift. Um, but uh, but what the calculations actually indicate is that we have uh, that we that we are prone to 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 charge noise here, um, which is occurring within a radius of about five nanometer from the from the emitters away. And, and, and what I think, or what we think, uh, what, what is the, the origin of this is that, that, uh, that here we're working with, uh, with implanted uh, germanium vacancy centers. So implantation means that the germanium um, is, 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 um, is uh, shoot into the diamond with an energy of about 300 electron, uh, kilo electron volts. And that leaves per implanted ion, it leaves about uh, 100 vacancies uh, deposited in the structure. And now, and now these, 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 these vacancies, they're not necessarily uh, mobile, but they can actually cluster. They can cluster in the vicinity of the color center. And, and, and vacancies are kind of known to, to, be, uh, to, to be charger or to, to, be, to, to function as, 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 as charge traps uh, deep inside the diamond. And I think, or we think that this is kind of the, the origin for these uh, spectral jumps. 
So, so if we have a spectrum which on, with only one, uh, with, with, with two different lines, so this indicates that we have one charge, scat uh, one charge scatterer. If we see, um, like in this case, uh, five different lines, so this, this, this indicates that we have two or more uh, charge scatterers, uh, which are kind of causing these, uh, these spectral jumps. Then um, I hope you're still with me. So, so, so in the in the last, uh, this is my last slide. So, so even for the for the uh, for the not for the nice spectra. So, if one if one carefully looks at these um, at these uh, at these uh, resonance scans, one can actually see that that while scanning through the resonance, so so sometimes the emitter actually goes into into something like uh, which looks like a dark state. So, and indeed now, the the the, the image here or the, the graph here in the center. So we put the laser on resonance. Uh, we record the counts uh, as a function of time, and we indeed see that the emitter actually starts to starts to blink. So, so there's uh, for, for certain periods, the emitter is bright, and then it goes into a dark state, but it recovers actually naturally um, again. So now, what you can do is is to is to bin uh, the, the the duration of these uh, of these uh, of these bright states into a histogram. This is what is shown here on the on the on the bottom plot. Um, Characterize the time constant and then and then plot this time constant as a function of uh, as a function of excitation power. Now what we see here is is that it's actually um, it is uh, what we see is um, and we're quite sure about this is a quadratic quadratic um, um, scaling with the excitation power, and this strongly indicates that it's actually a two photon process uh, which is happening here. So what we what we believe it is that um, that that when 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 resonantly um, uh, driving the transition between one and three, uh, we occasionally um, ionize the emitter from from the from the ground state into the conduction band by the absor by the by the absorption of two photons, uh, which leaves the system in the uh, in a dark state, which then eventually uh, recovers uh, spontaneously, and then activates the emitter um, again. All right. So, um, so, so, so this is an experiment uh, which has been, uh, I think, going on for, for for quite some time. So, I would like to highlight the contribution of of of, of Rasmus um, and uh, Olivier and Erica in collaboration with the group of Lillian Childress from from McGill University. So they, so these these three have have um, thoroughly driven the, the the room temperature experiment, and this was taken over recently by by, by Maxime, Daniel, and Ilya, who are now working with the with the cryogenic. Um, integration. And with this, I would like to finish and thank you for your attention. <laughs>